Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Earth Day Every Day for this evening. I am recording this, so we've started the recording. Um, so tonight we have Kathleen Kerwin, who will be presenting about um, urban wildlife. So Kathleen uh, works for the Rutgers Wildlife and Conservation Management Program and responsibilities include development and delivery of extension and education programming about wildlife and wildlife conservation. She has an undergraduate degree in ecology, evolution and natural resources from Rutgers, as well as a master's degree in ecology and evolution. She has a background in wildlife monitoring and management with project project experience throughout the United States. Um, so just a couple of introductory notes as we get started here. As I mentioned, we are recording. Um, for questions, if you would, um, if you can put them in the chat box. So if you're on your computer, there should be a little chat bubble uh, near the bottom of the screen that will say chat and it'll have like a, um, a speech bubble icon. If you're on your phone, you may need to tap the screen to bring up some of the menus. Um, and it may be in, in, a, in a menu that uh, you get to through the three dots, like a more menu. Um, but again, it'll say chat and have the speech bubble. If you could proceed with the next slide, Kathleen. Um, so we will be contacting people um, or we will be collecting responses at the end of the, of the program. Um, we'll have a poll and we'll be collecting those responses. So we're, we're using those for research, if you will. Um, so this slide gives some information about that research. And in those poll questions at the end, it will ask you if you're interested in being a subject in this research. So you can uh, opt in or opt out of that, if you will. And the next slide. And finally, just as a note that um, Rutgers Cooperative Extension programs are offered to all. And um, if you'd like more information or if you have a um, complaint about, about this program, there's a link there that you can um, contact to address your, your concerns. And finally, I am going to put in a link in the chat. Um, this program is offered free for everyone, obviously, um, but we will accept donations. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat if you'd like to donate for this program and similar programs, similar educational programs. And with that, I will pass it over to Kathleen. Thank you, Sal, for the introduction. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about urban wildlife. Uh, we have a lot to cover, uh, but the three broad categories we'll talk about um, are first go over definitions. So what does it mean to be urban wildlife? Um, what are some characteristics that these species have in common? Then we'll go into some examples, specifically deer, coyotes, uh, we'll talk about a group of animals called the mesopredators, uh, and then we'll talk about bats because um, that's one of our program specialties and it's also Halloween. Um, and then we will end with how to avoid um, having any sort of conflict with urban wildlife or wildlife in general. So urban wildlife or I should say wildlife in general um, can be divided into three broad categories. Uh, when it comes to how these animals do around humans. So the first category that we're not gonna be talking about today um, are the avoiders. These are species that are very sensitive to human activity. Um, they generally don't use human resources because they have very specific habitat requirements or very specific food resources that they have to eat. A great example of this is the panda bear. Um, they're not obviously from North America, um, but they're just kind of a interesting animal because they're a bear. So they originally in their 
evolutionary history used to eat meat and plant matter, um, but over time have evolved to only eat one thing, and that's bamboo. 99% of their diet is bamboo. So you're not going to see a bear in an urban environment like you do see black bears uh, in New Jersey. These guys are only going to be in these very specific habitats that have bamboo. Um, An example closer to home would be the pileated woodpecker. This is our biggest woodpecker that we have in New Jersey. And they require big trees, so mature forests that have large trees um, and trees that are dead or dying that have lots of insects in them so that they can eat them. Um, they also need bigger trees so that they can carve out cavities and, and, and raise their young and make those nests. Um, so these are animals that you just wouldn't find in an urban environment because they have these specific habitat needs. Um, on the other hand, you have what are called the adapters. Um, and most of what we talk about today will fit into this category. These are animals that um, they're just good at adapting and they do very well in these suburban, urban backyard type habitats where there might be patches of forest nearby, but also uh, more park-like habitat. So open space um, like parks or maybe ball fields or cemeteries, um, golf courses, anything like that. Um, so not really natural habitat, it's still human um, influenced, but they can do well in those sorts of spaces. Um, a lot of these species can be considered edge species, and we'll talk uh, more about what that means. Uh, but again, our two big examples here will be the deer and the coyote. The next category that we um, refer to are the exploiters. These are species that do very, very, very well um, in urban environments. A lot of times these are non-native species, so animals that didn't, it didn't evolve here, they came here by accident or someone brought them. Um, and if you go to any city or, or town, um, you're probably going to find um, some of these birds. So we have a house sparrow, um, we have pigeons. If you've ever eaten at an outdoor restaurant, I guarantee that there's been house sparrows, you know, hopping around your feet looking for some crumbs. Um, the males have that black bib on their chest, so they're, they're very um, identifiable. Um, but if you're walking through pristine forests uh, up in the Adirondacks or something, you're not going to see a pigeon fly by. Um, these, these species are very adapted to be in urban places. So what is urban wildlife? Um, we're going to be lumping the, that, those two categories, the adapters and the exploiters, um, into what we refer to as urban wildlife, not just urban, but also suburban, really any of these human dom dominated landscapes. Um, these species can include both native and non-native. Um, and the other thing to point out here is that most people, when they think about wildlife in general, they're thinking urban wildlife because most people live in urban or suburban environments. So those are the species that they're going to be seeing on a regular basis or at least know about because um, they've had some sort of interaction with them in the past. Um, these species are typically raccoons, opossums, um, coyotes are becoming more common, birds like red-tailed hawks or vultures, um, European starlings, uh, black bears, we have a ton of those in New Jersey. So these are the species that we're going to be going over. A lot of these guys have similar characteristics with each other. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, they're generally all going to be omnivores and generalists. Omnivores meaning that they eat both meat and also plant matter. And generalists meaning they're not picky. They're going to eat whatever comes in front of them. Um, another term for this would be opportunistic omnivore. They take whatever opportunity pre pre presents itself in terms of a meal. They will often take advantage of human food sources. So this could be your garden, you know, think of a groundhog that eats all the vegetables you just planted. Um, garbage, if there's, you know, garbage that's not secured properly, you know, we often think of raccoons or possums in the garbage can. Domestic animals, so unfortunately things like coyotes might see small pets, you know, small dogs or cats or livestock um, as a prey source. Um, pet food, so if you're feeding anything outside, cat or dog food, um, wild animals will definitely eat that, or bird feed, etc. 
they often have a very high tolerance for human disturbance. So this could be habitat loss or fragmentation. They're probably not going to care much if a new house comes up in the neighborhood. Um, light and noise pollution probably won't bother them that much. Uh, and invasive species. So if there is a forested area nearby and it starts to become invaded with a lot of invasive plants, um, they probably won't care. They also have high fecundity, which means they have a lot of babies uh, and a lot of those babies survive, like this poor possum um, with all those babies attached to her. Are there any questions so far? Hi, Kathleen. Sorry, Hi. That's um, okay. no questions. No questions okay. so far. Cool. We'll keep going. So we'll dive deep into a few species. Deer, they are the ultimate edge species, and I'll, I'll explain exactly what that means. A coyotes, they're pretty new to New Jersey, but they have quickly become um, prevalent throughout the state. And then we'll talk about those mesopredators, which basically means middle predator. Um, they're in the middle of the food chain. They're not top predators, but they're not at the bottom. So this includes raccoons, fox, possums, cats. And then we'll talk about bats, which is our specialty. White-tailed deer are very interesting. They are an iconic wildlife species in New Jersey. I bet every single person that lives here can point out uh, what a white-tailed deer looks like. They're a major game animal, um, so they are hunted. Um, they provide a great food source for many people that a lot of times um, hunters can donate meat to homeless shelters um, to feed the needy. Um, and they were almost completely gone from New Jersey by the late 1800s, mostly due to over harvesting. There was just no regulations and they were being hunted almost to extinction. Um, but since then, they have rebounded um, significantly and we now have a very large deer population um, really throughout the Northeast. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, so the, the, the main reasons, number one, are that um, during the last time period, so the same time period during the late 1800s, um, there was local extinction of these apex predators, these predators that would um, be hunting and killing deer. Uh, those would be the wolves that we used to have in New Jersey and also eastern cougars, also known as mountain lions. Um, they obviously no longer live here, but they used to. Um, so there's no more predators except for really cars and human hunters. Um, they also have a high reproductive rate. There's really great habitat for deer in New Jersey. They like eating um, agricultural products. They like eating landscaped things. Um, so because of that, because of all these food uh, resources, they're just very good at reproducing. Um, so fawns are born in the spring and by the fall, they're about six months old. Um, and female fawns are capable of reproducing their first year. They may, may only have one um, fawn, but in subsequent years, it's very common for deer to give birth to twins or even triplets. And then most of New Jersey um, is privately owned. So New Jersey, the Division of Fish and Wildlife um, puts out very um, liberal hunting regulations. Um, a lot of times there's an unlimited amount, amount of antlerless deer that people can harvest throughout the hunting season. The archery season is very long. Um, it basically goes from September to February. Um, but the problem is there's not much access to hunting. Since most of New Jersey is privately owned, um, if private landowners don't want hunting on their property, then that creates a lot of haven for deer to go into. And then the biggest reason um, is for these higher deer populations um, is habitat fragmentation. Um, this is a concept that is kind of interesting. It's a little counterintuitive. Um, we think that if we create a suburban development, we're displacing all these deer, but in reality, we're just creating more and more habitat for them because they are what we call an edge species um, and development and agriculture and all these um, land modifications typically just create more and more edge habitat, which the deer really like. I like this picture because it's a nice example of what I mean by edge. So if we just pretend that this entire square 
probably at one point was covered in just forest, um, there wouldn't be many deer um, in this setting because they're not an interior habitat species. They like to be on the edge. Um, and if this entire square had forest in it, um, maybe the only edge was, was around this square um, in the picture. So just imagine that was one big forest um, surrounded by meadow or something else. But now as we create these suburban um, developments, we're carving that forest habitat up into these strips. Um, some of them are bigger than others. Some of them are pretty long. Um, and what we're doing is really decreasing the biodiversity. So de decreasing the amount of species that like to be in the interior of a habitat. And then you're increasing the species that like to be on the edge, like deer. Because now you have edge all over the place. Anywhere the forest meets a backyard um, is an edge. And there's some pretty negative impacts of having too many deer. Our best guesses as biologists and scientists are that, you know, back when Europeans came to uh, the US, deer were probably at about five to 10 per square mile in terms of population size. And now we're close to 50 or even over 100 deer per square mile in many towns in New Jersey. So that's a huge increase in population size. Um, and this obviously is gonna have some effect. For one, it's a safety issue. There's a lot of vehicle collisions, especially this time of year. So we'll talk about that later, how to avoid uh, wildlife vehicle collisions, especially with deer. Uh, there's a lot of agricultural damage. Some of it's very, very severe. Um, there's farmers in New Jersey that are really struggling with deer damage. And really the only way to keep deer out of a place is to put up a, a very high fence. Deer can jump. Um, so these fences have to be at least eight feet high. Uh, this can be very expensive, very cost prohibitive. Um, so there's just, it's very tough to be a farmer in New Jersey. Um, and then the ecological effects. So if you think about a forest, a forest should have structure. There should be mature trees. There should be younger trees. There should be shrubs. There should be an herbaceous layer of you know, diversity of plants that then support birds and insects and small mammals. They keep the soil in place. Um, there's a whole balance that happens. When you have too many deer, they're eating all those understory plants out. And then the other thing that happens um, is that they're not really eating a lot of the invasive plants that come in, they're preferentially eating our native species. So now we have forests that are very dominated by invasive plants. This is a photograph I took just a few months ago in Morristown. Um, a lot of times if you're hiking around um, you know, state parks or, or this was an Audubon owned uh, piece of property, they have these um, deer exclosure fences up so I took the picture at the fence line. Um, and this is to keep deer out of specific areas. And then a lot of research goes on to see what grows without the impact of having too many deer. And in this case, it's pretty dramatic. On the right side, we have very dense layer of herbaceous and woody plants. Most of them are native. And on the left side, it's just barren. There's really nothing growing there. Um, that would support any sort of, you know, nesting bird or, or anything like that. So these are just some of the effects. I'm going to make a big switch and talk about coyotes. Is there any questions about deer before I move on? Yeah, we did have one. Well, I have, I have a difficult one for you, but first, <laughs> um, there's a question from SMAD. Um, how can we persuade our individual townships to band together to create a cohesive plan uh, to control a deer population? That's a great question, and it's it's very difficult. Um, there seems to be a growing um, perception against hunting, um, but unfortunately, it is the most effective and humane way to control deer populations. Um, there's a lot of, well, there is some work being done looking at um, fertility control methods, but the reality is um, birth control 
is extremely expensive to administer in deer. You have to either trap them and, and give them, you know, the dose. We, a lot of times it only lasts one year. Um, it's just very, very expensive and really not feasible. It's also not, that would never work, um, do, you know, doing some sort of birth control wouldn't work um, in these open populations where, you know, it's not an island. We have deer coming in from other places all the time. So it's really tough. Um, there has to be education initiatives to try and increase um, support for hunting programs. The state also offers some programs like community-based um, deer uh, programs that allow towns to take uh, more deer than just what's allowed during the hunting season. But it's really, really tough. Um, some towns are, are doing pretty good jobs at coming up with at least a plan um, and implementing some management hunts like on certain properties. But at the end of the day, there's so much private property that that's where we really have to get access to. I don't have an answer to that, but hopefully okay. that helped. <laughs> And that was actually along the lines of my, my question as well. So um, I think you addressed that. Another question is about deer repellents. Um, just to unpack it a little bit, first, do they work? And what is it that they're doing to keep deer away from plants? And is there some kind of natural alternative that works? So I, I will talk a little about this later, but to my knowledge, any type of repellent isn't really going to work, especially in the long term. Um, a hungry deer is just going to eat what it wants to eat. And those repellents get washed off in the rain. So you have to keep applying them. Um, I don't know too much about what the options are, um, just because I, I, just, I don't think they work very well. Um, the only real way to stop deer from eating anything is to exclude them and, and put some sort of fence up, which I know is not an option for a lot of people. Um, so there, um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know specifics on that. Okay, that's what we have for questions at this point. Cool, thanks. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about coyotes. Um, this is a photo taken by my friend Brian at the Rutgers Eco Preserve a few years ago. And I actually did see this coyote one time, but um, it's kind of a cool example because he's that blonde color. Usually they're not that strikingly blonde, um, but it can happen. Um, so it's kind of cool, creepy photo for Halloween. Coyotes are extremely interesting because they were not always on the East Coast at all. Um, historically, they only ever existed uh, in the western U.S. So they dominated these open prairie habitats and deserts that we find kind of in the middle of America and the western side of America in this darker orange that you see on the map. That's where they historically lived. And then starting in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they made this major shift uh, outward from that original range. And you can now find coyotes in the all of the U.S., um, much more into Canada now and also into Central America. So why did this happen? There's two major reasons for it. Number one was large scale deforestation that was occurring um, as European, you know, people of European descent on the East Coast started their westward expansion. They were doing a lot of cutting down trees, uh, making room for homesteads, making room for farming and ranching. And since that's perfect habitat for coyotes, they, they didn't typically live in forested areas um, that helped them expand. And at the same time, there were these large scale predator removal campaigns and even sponsored by the federal government uh, to remove top predators like wolves, Eastern cougars, which are also known as uh, mountain lions and coyotes as well. Um, but the wolves and the cougars really took um, the brunt of that. And coyotes compete directly with those animals. So, and oftentimes they're the ones losing because they're smaller than a wolf or a mountain lion. If you remove those wolves and mountain lions, you're now opening up all this space for coyotes to live. And that's exactly what happened. There's also 
an interesting genetic component. So we started out with this Western coyote. It was smaller, it is, it is smaller, they still live there. Um, and again, they live in that more open landscape. We know from genetic studies and looking at their DNA that as they marched across the Great Lakes region into Southern Canada and eventually onto the, into the Northeast of the US, there was definitely some interbreeding going on with both wolves and domestic dogs. This is because as the coyotes expanded, there wasn't that many of them on the landscape yet, and wolves were getting um, persecuted heavily, so there wasn't that many of them on the landscape either. So the two species were sometimes desperate to find a mate, and they mated with each other. Same thing with dogs, as we have coyotes moving into the um, eastern seaboard, um, we know that they uh, occasionally did mate with dogs if they didn't have other coyotes around. This all happened 50 to 100 plus years ago. Um, there's really no evidence that they're still interbreeding. Uh, and what we have now living all over the East Coast is the Eastern coyote. They're a little bit bigger than they used to be out West. Uh, they have bigger heads, they have bigger teeth. That's all due to that genetic influence from wolves and dogs. And they also come in a wide variety of colors also for that same reason. There's a lot of misconception over these, um, over what the Eastern Coyote is. So a lot of people will throw these terms around, coy wolf, coy dog. Um, these terms are very sensationalized and in my opinion, pretty misleading. Um, these animals that we have are the Eastern Coyote, oops. Um, that is the correct term for them. Um, I, I, I think saying koi wolf makes it sound like they're half wolf, half coyote or half dog. Um, that's just not true. These are, um, we know that they did interbreed with these other animals, but at this point they're only breeding with each other um, and they are just now a subspecies of the original coyote. Um, so Eastern coyote is the correct term to use. They first arrived in New Jersey in 1939, that was the first sighting in Lambertville, Hunterdon County. Um, but it took about 20 years to get a confirmed report down in Cape May. Uh, and since then they've really expanded. So this is a, a map, it's a heat map uh, put together by New Jersey Fish and Wildlife. Um, and what it shows is a density of reports. It's very, very hard to study coyotes because they're very elusive. They're nocturnal for the most part. Um, and they occur in pretty low numbers. But um, if we look at reports, so based on harvest reports, they are hunted and trapped. So, you know, if you ever hunt or trap a coyote, you have to report it to the state. Um, that all gets collected. Um, Roadkill sightings and just sightings in general. Um, so the darker the red color, the more sightings um, there have been. So we see that coyote numbers seem to be densest in the Pine Barrens, so South Jersey and the Pine Barrens, and the northwest corner of the state, which is where we have a lot more mountainous forested regions. And I should say that um, our eastern coyote is much better adapted for these more forested settings, um, probably again because of that interbreeding, but they do great in, in the woods. But they're also doing great in urban areas. Um, at this point, and this map's from 2016, so it's a little outdated, but um, there's been sightings of coyotes in 96% of the land area of New Jersey. So at this point, they live everywhere. Again, that opportunistic omnivore term, um, these animals will eat anything, um, mostly rodents. They will prey on young or injured deer, uh, rabbits, insects, frogs, raccoons, fruits, nuts, eggs, sometimes garbage, um, and even livestock. Um, mostly sheep, or if you have chickens or rabbits, um, they'll go, over, go after those too. Um, it's pretty interesting though, because usually when an animal didn't evolve somewhere and then all of a sudden they showed up, there can be some pretty negative consequences to that, uh, but that's not really happening. We, it seems like the coyote is kind of filling um, or helping to fill the role that the wolf le left behind or the, the ecological niche. Um, so coyotes are eating a lot of rodents and rabbits, which are also prey that wolves would take. Um, they do 
harvest some deer, um, but it's mostly fawns and there's not really been any evidence to suggest that coyotes are having impact on deer population numbers overall, not like a wolf. Um, the difference, the major difference between coyotes and wolves are that um, wolves live in packs and they're a lot bigger. Um, so when they hunt together, they can take down that bigger prey like a deer. Um, coyotes live, their basic social unit is a mated pair. So a male, female, and plus their young. Their young can stick around for a year um, or they disperse, but um, they're not in these bigger groups or packs like wolves would be. So they don't typically take down bigger animals. Uh, but they do have this interesting effect, and we're going to talk about it now, on mesopredators. And you could consider a coyote a mesopredator um, if there were wolves around, because the wolves would be the apex. Um, but in our scenario, um, they're kind of at the top, and then we have these mesopredators or these middle-of-the-road uh, predators, foxes, raccoons, feral cats. Um, and all of these mesopredators have a pretty big effect on things below them. So what they're eating, songbirds, shorebirds, turtles, turtle eggs. Um, so having a coyote around could potentially um, protect some of these lower on the food chain animals. And here are these mesopredators. So the, these are wildlife species that kind of everyone has a, an image of the raccoon, the skunk, the fox, the red fox, um, and, and feral cats or outdoor cats. Um, these top two guys, the raccoon, the skunk, they've been around forever. Um, there's some debate on when the red fox got here. It probably wasn't always in New Jersey, um, but they were probably more uh, native to like more northern forests and then made their way down. Um, cats are not native. Um, they evolved in Africa. Um, they were brought here by people. Um, so they have a pretty big effect on our environment as well. But all these, all these species do really well in urban areas. Um, that, that they take food handouts. They'll, they're pretty adaptable. Um, they like garbage. Um, so they have all these things in common. And then there's this ecological term called mesopredator release. And so this happens when, again, you remove that apex predator and those middle of the road predators then have the chance to really increase in number. Um, so without any pressure from above, and like nothing's hunting them um, and they're doing really well in these urban areas, their numbers can skyrocket. Um, and this can be a major problem with other native wildlife, especially in surrounding areas. And this can result in what we call biotic homogenization. So you're, you're decreasing the biodiv biodiversity. Um, some species like these mesopredators do really, really well, and then they eat everything else. Um, so raccoons love eggs. There's been a lot of issues with like nesting turtles. They'll actually go out and dig up all the eggs and eat them. Um, cats, you know, it's not the cat's fault. Um, the cats are very, very good at, at killing things. They're very good at hunting um, and our small mammals and birds that we have here in North America um, just not have not had the chance to evolve um, defense against such a good predator. So cats have had a pretty significant effect on a lot of our birds, um, small mammals, even uh, reptiles and amphibians. And then again, the fox, um, the fox was probably more native to these um, northern forests, but we're now finding them wherever we find people. Um, so we've developed our shoreline. We all have, we all love the beach, going to the beach, um, and now we're seeing foxes there. And there never used to be foxes at the beach. And they are having a pretty big effect on things like piping plovers, which are a, a bird that nests right in the sand. Um, other things like American oyster catchers, least terns. These are all what we call shorebirds. Um, they nest directly on the sand. They just use camouflage to help um, conceal themselves. Um, and they're not used to having these types of mammals just coming and, and eating them. Um, we are doing some research on this. Uh, this is me and a graduate student, Chris Crosby. He got funding from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 20 GPS collars. And last winter, we went around um, 
basically the entire coast of New Jersey from Sandy Hook to Cape May. We caught 20 foxes, put collars on them, and he's been getting all this data on their movements, trying to figure out really what the effect they do have um, on coastal ecosystems. So uh, he just got funding for four more, which is exciting for me because I get to go out again and do this work. Um, and yeah, stay tuned on, on what his research shows. All right, before we move on to bats, any questions? Yes. Okay, so there was a question um, about deers and deer fencing. Mm -hmm. um, so in this one case, uh, Christine Kulikowski noted that um, in their town where there's a lot of deer, in one case, the deer will definitely jump a four foot fence that is a chain link fence, but seem not to want to go over the fence that's four feet, that's a board fence where they can't see through it, even though there's like tasty plants on the other side. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if that's just because, yeah, they can't see and they're they're afraid to jump somewhere where they can't see. Um, I just know that the if you want complete 100% protection, it has to be, I believe, at least eight feet because um, they can jump that high. Um, that's if you like definitely need to keep them out, but that's that's a good point. Um, I'd have to look more into that. It's interesting. But I guess in general, um, for any of these wildlife animals, if they can't see, they're less comfortable going somewhere. Yeah. So that, that may be a factor. Definitely. There's another, there another question about um, coyotes, which is if we see them, should we report them in any way? Um, not necessarily. Um, I mean, it is good data. So if you did want to, I'm sure it would add to a, an updated map version, but it's not like, you know, it's not necessary. Um, but you could contact uh, the, the state, so the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they probably have a reporting number for that. Um, yeah. So I did want to mention, I don't think blonde coyotes are creepy, but <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm kind of woke like that. <laughs> and I yeah. and I did, I did appreciate you, um, addressing the the koi wolf idea um, at least where i am i hear a lot of rumors about these koi wolves that are these giant canines in the woods but but i mean but i mean honestly um you know the coyotes we have here versus what i've seen in the western u.s they're they're larger you know they're kind of strikingly sort of relatively big you know yeah for, for a wild dog but yeah, they're not, they're not like wolves. No, they're not like wolves. And I, I didn't mention this, but um, coyotes, like people think of them as like really, really big, but they're actually only like 30 to 40 pounds. So, I mean, I, I think like an average German shepherd is like 80 pounds. So they're like half the weight of like a large dog, but they're fluffy and they're, you know, they look, I think they look bigger than they are, but um, 30 to 40 pounds, like when I think about you know, my dog's 65 pounds and she does, she's not that big to me, but she's also very long and lanky. I don't know. It's all, it's all like in your perception. Foxes are only 10 pounds, which is crazy. <laughs> They're so small. Yeah, so much smaller than my cats. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, yep. Hang on, let me see. Um, Yeah, there's just a comment about uh, deer probably won't jump if they can't see where they're landing, which makes sense. And Steve Yerjo shared a, um, a link in the chat that goes to everybody about reporting coyotes oh, to cool. the state. Thank you. That's very helpful. All right, moving on to bats. Bats are kind of in their own category. They don't really fit into the descriptions that I was talking about earlier with the urban wildlife, but we have two species that are very well adapted to using man-made structures. So they do kind of count as a suburban urban wildlife um, when they start using man-made structures. 
but they're very specialized. All of our bats here in New Jersey, they're only eating insects. So they're not gonna be going through your garbage or anything like that. They're just eating bugs and they sometimes like to live in your attic. Um, they're also very misunderstood. So we have lots of creepy, um, you know, Halloween references to bats. They're nocturnal, so we don't see them. And when we don't see something, we tend to be afraid of it because we don't know that much about it or it just becomes creepy over time. And if it's sensationalized enough, um, you know, people are very scared of bats. But they're basically harmless and they eat a lot of bugs. So we should all like them. Um, in general, bats all around the world have all these things in common. They are mammals. So that means that they have hair or fur, just like us. Um, they have mammary glands, so they're actually breastfeeding their young, uh, and they give birth to live young. It's not like they're laying eggs or anything like that. They're the only mammal capable of true flight, which makes them very unique. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of flying squirrels, which we do have also in New Jersey, um, and they're not actually flying. Flying squirrels just have a flap of skin on the side of their bodies, and they'll run up to a, a tall tree and then just jump off a high point and glide to a lower point. But bats are actually flying, which is pretty cool. There's over 1,300 species of bats around the world. This makes up a fifth of all mammals. The only other group of mammals that has more species diversity are the rodents. Um, other than that, it's bats. There's only 47 of these in the US and then nine in New Jersey. So a lot of the species diversity occurs more in the tropics but we do have nine really great species right here in our state. This is a bat from the Philippines, so don't get scared. <laughs> They're a type of flying fox. They're probably the biggest bat that we have in the world with a five and a half foot wingspan. But I really like this picture because it demonstrates um, bat biology and really how they fly. So the, the Latin name um, to describe the order of bats is Chiroptera, which literally translates into hand wing. And when you look at this picture, you can really see the wing structure. So the little appendage sticking up, that's the thumb on the bat. Um, and then if you just go down those bones, it's the pointer finger, middle finger, um, ring finger, and then pinky finger. And they're all very elongated um, with that thin layer of skin between them, uh, which makes up their wing. This is very different than a bird. So on a bird, their finger bones have mostly fused together. And then their primary and secondary feathers, which are their flight feathers, um, come off of their arm bones. So very different um, style of flying. Um, so this makes bats very unique. Like I mentioned before, we have two species of bat that are very commonly found in man-made structures. Um, these are the big brown bat and the little brown bat. Big browns are more common nowadays because little browns have been devastated by a disease called white nose syndrome, um, which has uh, decimated their populations. But for whatever reason, these two have decided that living in an attic or somewhere else on someone's house is really great because both these species will form colonies uh, in the spring and summer, females of these species will form these um, groups and we call them maternity colonies. And they all give birth to one baby around uh, May or June. And so having a nice, warm, dry, predator-free space like an attic is very attractive to these bats. This is a diagram that just shows uh, common places that bats will often roost. Um, Oftentimes they get into the attic, um, they'll go under loose siding, or if there's like a torn screen on your window, they'll get in there, um, loose shingles, really any little space they can wedge themselves. Luckily they don't chew and they don't scratch. So they're not like a squirrel that will just like bust its way in. They will only enter through cracks and crevices that already exist. Bats are protected under the New Jersey Endangered Non-Game Species Conservation Act. Um, so this means that you cannot kill, hunt, or harass bats in any way. Um, I've been in a lot of attics where there's glue traps, um, and this is not a legal way to um, try and get bats out. So I oftentimes remove those. Um, this makes it a little tricky if you're trying to get bats out of your attic. 
Um, but the state has put forth these safe dates. So if you do have bats, um, the only real way to get them out is through an exclusion process, um, which I'll talk about soon. Um, but you can only do that process during the month of April or August 1st to October 15th. Um, this protects bats during that summer period when they are formed in these colonies. Um, the females give birth to what we call them pups. Um, and then these pups can't fly for about five weeks. So if you did do this exclusion process, the adults would be able to fl fly out, but the pups would be trapped inside. Um, and then you can't do this work during the winter either because sometimes bats will hibernate in your attic or wherever it might be. Um, and it's really hard to know if they're there because they're not pooping, they're not making noise. Um, so you can't do the exclusion because um, you might trap them inside. But um, this is how an exclusion works. You first have to identify where the bats are getting in and out from. And then you then um, seal up all the secondary cracks. And then over that primary crack, you're putting some sort of one-way um, entry, or sorry, one-way device over that entryway. This allows bats to leave, but they can't get back in. So in this photograph, we see a big piece of mesh. Um, sometimes it's a cone, it's just something that the bats can leave out of, but then there's just no way for them to crawl back through that. You have to leave that up for at least a week um, for um, at least a week during some good, good weather. You don't want it to be too windy or too cold or have any sort of storm event. You want to give them plenty of time for all of them to leave. Once that happens, you can seal up that primary crack or crevice um, and then you're good to go. A good way to find out what that primary crack or crevice is, is by standing out at dusk during the summertime, um, right as birds start to quiet down um, and it gets a little dark out. That's typically when bats leave um, and you can see them flying around. Um, and if you have a good visual of your house, you'll be able to see exactly where they're coming out of. And that can be very helpful. At Rutgers, we do uh, put up bat houses. Anyone getting an exclusion done We'll, we can put up a free bat house for you. Um, through our program and other programs, um, doing some research on what makes bat houses successful, we have found that bat houses put directly on structures are much more efficient and uh, much more successful at getting bats to move into them. For whatever reason, bat houses put on poles and trees, which is where most people want them. Um, the bats don't want them there. They're, they're not going to use them. Probably because the species, the big brown and the little brown um, bat, are looking at structures to roost in. Um, and especially if you're getting an exclusion done, they're going to get kicked out of your attic or wherever it is on the house. Um, and then they're going to be trying to get back in and looking for somewhere else to go nearby. So if there's a bat house right there, they're very likely to use it. And as long as that exclusion process was done correctly, they shouldn't be able to get back inside um, the house. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions on bat houses. Um, I can talk a lot more about it or um, help you through this process or get you on our list to get a bat house. We also sell them to people who just want one. Um, it's a good time to stop for more questions if anyone has any. Sure, I just launched the poll. Um, so if people would be so kind as to fill that out, we appreciate you doing that. So um, whether you're on your computer or your phone, it should kind of pop up as the poll. Um, if you have problems, I guess, uh, put a note in the chat and we'll try to direct you to that. So just a few questions there in the poll, um, which is how we assess um, how effective our programming is. So for questions um, about bats. Yeah, so um, Jill Prasner had a question um, that, that they used to see bats at dusk fairly commonly. And then for a few years they didn't, and now they're starting to see them again. Is there any kind of dynamic in New Jersey like that going on? Yeah, so it, it's been interesting. Uh, white nose syndrome is the disease that I mentioned, and that came here in 2007, 2008. 
and we saw some dramatic uh, decreases in especially our little brown bat populations. So for example, there's a, a mine in northern Jersey where most of these little browns would spend the winter and biologists would go in and count them every winter just to keep track on them. So th that population went from 30,000 bats in the wintertime to down to just 300. So massive, massive decline in some species. So that might have been why you were seeing less. Um, we are seeing more of some other species. So like as little browns kind of declined, we've seen more and more big browns taking their place, like roost locations where we used to know little browns were during the summer, we're now seeing have big brown bats. Um, and on the other hand, we are seeing some rebound in little browns. Um, it, and we're doing a lot of research on that um, in our program. But we're hoping that there's some sort of resistance to the disease. So after that initial die off, we've seen that some individual bats um, that didn't die um, continue to survive every single year, even though they're getting infected with the disease every winter, um, they're surviving. So we're hoping that they're passing those genes on to their offspring. But since bats only have one pup every single year, um, they're very slow reproducers. So they really don't fall into those other categories. I was talking about how urban wildlife tends to have a lot of babies and they all survive. Um, bats are not really like that. They only have that one pup. Um, and, you know, they're just, if there is going to be a population recovery for some of these hard hit species, it's going to take a really long time. But I'm glad that you're seeing more. That's good. Okay, a few quick questions also on bats. Um, a note that the presentation is very insightful. Thank you. Um, can you place a bat house in a mixed urban suburban area? You definitely can. Um, so we have found through a, a small research study we did um, that if you simply put a bat house on a structure, there's about a 30% chance um, of bats moving in, even like in suburban areas. Um, if it's too urban, that it might that chance will probably go down. Um, they do like to have some sort of forested area nearby or um, some sort of like stream or water source. Um, if you have bats in your attic and you're getting them kicked out and you put a bat house up, you, there's close to an 80% chance of them moving in, um, which is pretty high. But you still have a chance, even if it's a suburban, even a little more urban area to get bats if you're putting that bat house on a structure. If it's on a pole or a tree, it's close to 0%. They just don't seem to like them. <laughs> I had a bat house on my... I had a bat house on my house, but it kept getting colonized by wasps. Ah, yeah, so that can happen. Um, sometimes that depends on how the bat house was built. There's kind of a sweet spot. Um, we call them chambers. So the spaces, um, you know, in the bat house where the bats can crawl up into. Um, if they're too wide, the bats won't like it. Um, and also, it's more likely wasps will move in. So I, I forget if it's three quarters of an inch or, or one inch wide is like the sweet spot where you're, you're gonna decrease wasps moving in, but it's still really good for bats. Um, that's really your only like maintenance issue with bat houses is the threat of wasps. And then if that does happen, we just tell people to go up in the winter with like a broomstick and try and knock them out. <laughs> what conditions promote bats moving into an area? Um, so if it's just an area in general, um, depends on the species. So all of our bats really like forests. Um, so our, those two species will use man-made structures, but all of them will use forests. Um, and a big habitat feature that they like, um, it's called snags. So dead trees that are still standing um, that have peeling bark and cavities in them. Um, those are used a lot by bats, uh, but even living trees are also very good. So trees in general, <laughs> bats need, um, and they need some sort of water source as well. And bugs, lots of bugs to eat. Not sure if that answered the question, but that's what bats like. So there is a question about ordering bat houses, and mm -hmm. there's a few links people put in. I'm going to assume that those address that question. Yeah, you got to be careful. There's a lot of bat houses out there that aren't 
designed properly if they're from Bat Conservation International, BCI. Um, that's kind of the world-renowned bat organization. They've done a ton of work into what makes a good bat house. Um, so if it's like sponsored by them or approved by them or made by them, uh, that's good. Um, I'd be happy to look at the links as well after this. Um, and we also, I can send out bat house plans. Like if, if anyone's interested in building a bat house, I can send out the recommended plans. Um, and then the, those plans are the bat houses that we use. Um, so you can also buy them from us. We sell and install them for $75 plus tax if you just want one put like on your house. And then about twice a year, we go out and do that. And finally, related question, what orientation should the bat houses be in terms of north, south, east, west? Yeah, so general thinking is that the bat houses should get um, that morning sun. Um, but in our study and other studies, the direction didn't matter. Like we had bat houses placed all over um, in every cardinal direction. Um, and the, really the only thing that mattered um, and made a difference in terms of whether bats were going to move in was if there was an exclusion done or if it was placed on a structure. Um, and there is some actual growing evidence that bat houses might be getting too hot. Um, and that can be really det detrimental. In general, they like it warm because their babies are born hairless and flightless, so they have to stay warm. Um, so uh, there's some growing concern that it might be getting too hot if they're getting full sun like all the time. Some people are suggesting you put up two bad houses, so one maybe in more of a shady um, area, one that gets more sun, and the bats can kind of switch around as as needed. Um, so short answer it might not matter <laughs> or having multiple options is always good okay and i guess finally there was a question about the poll um it looks like about three quarters of people have have answered it so i think it's working okay and there's a request for um a list for installing bat houses in a community garden? Um, a list for what exactly? Not sure, but maybe maybe if we can um, just send out a list of resources for bat houses. It sounds like there's a lot of questions about that. Yeah, sure. Um, and my email okay. will, will be listed at the end, so feel free to reach out to me. Cool. OK, so moving on to how to avoid conflict um, with urban wildlife. Um, Sal, the poll popped up for me. It's kind of blocking my screen. Oh, I see it. I can X out. Okay. Sorry, everybody. All right. So the biggest thing to avoid any sort of conflict with wildlife, um, is to avoid feeding wildlife. Um, a lot of times people are unintentionally feeding wildlife, but sometimes are actually intentionally doing it as well. Um, and what happens when wildlife gets fed, especially these species that um, are so adaptable and they're these opportunistic omnivores. So if they, if they get an easy opportunity for a meal, they're gonna take it. Um, the term we use is habituation. Habituation is what happens when these animals lose their natural fear of people. And almost always this happens when they start associating people with food access. And this is where we run into a lot of problems. But some potential food um, access that you might not even think about is garbage. Um, so making sure that your garbage is secured if you have an open compost, that might attract some unwanted animals. Um, outdoor pet food. So if you have any sort of dog or cat food outside, uh, wildlife will readily eat that. Um, and then again, if you're in an area where there might be coyotes, um, do not leave a small pet unattended, especially at night. If you have a, a small dog or cat, um, even rabbits, chickens, like these things need to be protected because to the coyote, it's just a food source. Why is it so bad to feed wildlife? Number one, I just talked about habituation. 
This is when animals lose that natural fear of people and that's when problems start. But besides that, human food is not healthy for wildlife. It can really cause issues like bread is not actually good for ducks. It can make them sick. Um, wildlife that lose their fear of people can become dangerous. Um, you know, wild animals can bite you and all mammals can carry rabies, which is 100% fatal. Um, so if you do get bit by a wild animal, you have to go to the doctor or hospital immediately to get post-exposure uh, post -exposure rabies vaccinations. Um, feeding wildlife in this way can also have just detrimental effects like we talked about before. Um, these meso predators can then become more successful, have more babies, and you're just putting nature even more out of balance than it already is. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so there's a term called hazing, which sounds kind of mean, um, but that's just the term used for um, basically negative stimuli to try and um, get these animals, try and instill some sort of their natural fear of people um, back. So if the animal is starting to lose its natural fear of people or it already has, um, these are some techniques that you can use. Um, a lot of this was geared, especially this first thing, towards coyotes. Um, people are very scared of coyotes um, or even bears. And the thing to know that is that you can't just run away from them. If a coyote is in your backyard um, and it's not running away like it should once it sees you, and maybe it's just sitting there and staring at you, um, if you run away, it's going to think, okay, I guess I can, I'm welcome here. It's no problem. Um, so don't run away. Stand tall, stand your ground, wave your arms. This is good for bears as well. Shout. You want to make yourself look big. If that doesn't work, which it should work most of the time, unless that animal is really starting to lose its fear of people. Um, then you can move on to the next step, which is basically throwing stuff at it. Um, you're not trying to hurt the animal. That's not the goal. It's just to try and scare it. So if you have a stick or a ball or a rock, throw it in its direction. Spraying it with a hose could be a good option. Um, but always make sure that the animal has room to escape. You don't want to do that in the corner of your fenced yard where it can't go anywhere. Um, but any mammal that's kind of showing these habituated um, characteristics, like it's not running away, it's hanging out, it feels too comfortable, it's staring at you, maybe it's coming towards you, um, these, these techniques would work. Um, and it might have to happen a few times. I mean, if that animal is very used to just being able to being able to go into your garbage can and get dinner. Um, first of all, you have to figure out why uh, it is getting into your yard and, and sticking around like that. So if it is the garbage, secure it, get rid of the outdoor pet food, um, and then do this a few times and it should work. So um, these are some of those other aversive conditioning and repellents. This is anything to do with sound, visual, odor. There's all these things available on like Amazon or garden centers. They really don't work in the long term. Like I said before, um, these animals are so adaptable that they're quickly going to learn that these stimuli, you know, aren't that bad. So if they get shot with water when they go towards the garden, um, that might scare them off that first time. But then they'll realize, wait, I can just you know, get a little wet and then still get access to the garden food, you know, behind that. So, yeah, and the repellents, a lot of times you have to just keep applying them over and over again. Um, and then even then they might not work. So the only real way to prevent wildlife from getting into an, an area is through fencing or exclusion, keeping them out. Um, this isn't practical a lot of times, especially around like a whole big property, but if you have a high value area, like a garden or a landscaped area that you just don't want anything in, this can be a really good solution. Wildlife, a lot of these species that I've mentioned, they can dig and they can also climb. So you have to design your fence in a way that will prevent that. Um, this is a nice little diagram that kind of shows um, how you can do that. The first thing is to bury um, the fencing underground about six inches and then have about 12 inches where it's um, extending away from the fence. So anything that 
tries to dig under like a groundhog or something like that is going to hit that fence and it can't go uh, past it. And then the other um, other thing you should think about is having it slant the top 12 to 18 inches slanting outward. So anything trying to climb up will then not be able to get over that slant. Five to six feet high is specific for coyotes. Um, it doesn't have to be that high if you're just trying to keep out smaller things. And then it should be eight feet high if, um, if you're trying to keep deer out. So it just depends what maybe you have in your community and what you're having issues with. Uh, but this is the best way to just keep them out for good. Another thing to think about is um, excluding access to under like a, 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 um, a deck or a porch. A lot of these animals will den. So coyotes, um, groundhogs, um, fox, uh, a lot of these things, raccoons, they will look for these denning sites. Um, to either spend the winter or um, raise their young. And if you don't want that happening, um, this is a good way to do that. Um, so same concept of, of burying that, that mesh or fencing material under the ground and extending it away a little bit. Please don't do this during the summer months when you're not sure if something might be under there or not. If you can totally see and it's clear of any wildlife, um, then go for it. But if there's a chance that something might be denning under there, you don't want to trap it in. That would be bad. And then I wanted to touch on trap and relocation. A lot of times we hear, uh, why can't we just trap the animals and bring them somewhere else to, you know, bring them out to nature, bring them to a forested area somewhere else, bring them to a park. And this is really not a good viable option. Um, removing animals from a specific area really just gives more space available for, for new animals to move right in. You're not preventing you know, a new animal from taking up that territory that you just vacated. Um, the other thing is it's not very humane. I mean, survival rates for wildlife um, that are trapped and relocated are generally pretty low. Um, because you're taking that animal and putting it into a totally new home range, a different habitat type, um, potentially. There's probably um, animals there that are resident that already have their territories and they're going to fight with any newcomer that comes in. And it's just not, it's just not good. Uh, there's a study done with coyotes in um, Chicago. Uh, I believe about 15 of them were trapped uh, from more of an urban area. They had radio collars put on them and then relo relocated. Every single one of them with, within about 48 hours had left the spot that it was relocated to and tried to get back to where it came from. And most of them got hit by cars and died. So not a good way to go. It can also spread disease. So in New Jersey, it's actually illegal um, to transport wildlife of certain species um, um, out of the town that they came from because they are vectors for rabies and other things. The only time that trapping something and removing it is appropriate is if there's some sort of obvious and immediate threat. Um, and in this case, the animal most likely will be euthanized um, because it can't be um, relocated. And at this point, if it is a nuisance animal and it's totally lost its fear of people, you wouldn't want to relocate it anyway, because you're just putting that, you know, nuisance animal into someone else's community. So that's basically why trap and relocation doesn't usually work. Um, just to clarify that. Um, are there any questions? Because I'm going to talk about driving <laughs> and how to avoid hitting deer since it's fall and it's breeding season. We've got a few questions. Why don't okay. you um, finish up and we'll hit them all at the end. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I wanted to include this because we are right in the middle of deer breeding season. It's heading into November, which is peak rut. Uh, that's what we call the breeding season. And at this point, um, bucks, the so male deer, are full of hormones and they are chasing does all over the place. 
Um, and when this happens, they are not paying attention to roadways. They are just darting across because that's their biology. They, they don't know to slow down and look both ways. Um, so I wanted to include this just to help keep everybody safe. Uh, and this is good for not just deer, but all wildlife. Um, these are tips on how to avoid collisions. Just slow down again, especially during the rut and especially around dusk and dawn. That's when deer and many other species are most active. So just be aware of that. That's that's their biology. That's when they're going to be running around the most, like you know, starting an hour before dusk um, and, and about an hour after dawn. Just be on your most alert um, behavior. Uh, pay attention. So, you know, look out if you see eye shine uh, on the sides of the road, ask your passengers to help you out. If there's any sort of like reflective eyes looking back at you, it's definitely slow down. Uh, using your high beams can be really effective, but, you know, make sure there's no oncoming traffic or anyone right in front of you. You don't want to blind them, but that can be really good for helping you to spot um, wildlife, especially in more maybe suburban or rural areas. Try not to tailgate because if the person in front of you has a deer dart out and slams on their brakes, you know, you could easily rear end them. And deer often move in herds. So if you see one, there's probably more, especially this time of year. If you see a doe, a female deer dart out in front of you, there is a very good chance that there's either another female um, or a buck like right behind her. So just slow down, stop, wait till they all go through. If you do see wildlife crossing the road, you know, slow down early and be prepared to come to a full stop. Like I said before, if you see one, you might, there's probably more coming. Um, don't try to maneuver around the animal. I've heard so many stories of people not hitting deer, but deer hitting them. Like they've literally slowed down and thought it was fine to just drive around and the deer would just slam into their car. So just give it space, give it time to just pass. Beeping can help too. High beams again, just try and encourage it out of the road. If a collision is inevitable, you're going fast and a deer all of a sudden is in front of you or really any wildlife, try to remain calm, hold your wheel steady, brake firmly, um, but don't swerve. That is when the most horrible accidents occur is when people swerve out of their lane to try and avoid the animal and they end up causing way more damage because they're either going into oncoming traffic, they lose control of the car, they hit a pole, they drive off the side of the road. Um, that's when the, the worst crashes occur. Almost always it's when people are swerving. So if, you, if you're gonna hit the deer, just be safe, try and brake as much as you can um, and just stay in your lane. And then if you do, end up hitting um, a deer or other wildlife and your vehicle can still operate, pull over to a safe area, turn on your hazards, call 911 or whatever emergency services around. If the animal is injured, do not approach it. Deer are very large animals and are gonna be very dangerous, especially if they're injured, um, they, can cause, they can cause you harm. So contact, um, the police or what or, or you know emergency services they will handle it don't try and handle it on your own um, and then call your insurance obviously as soon as you can to report any damages so i wanted to create or include a whole section on how you can make a positive difference but i figured i wouldn't have enough time so i just wanted to leave uh leave off the talk with just talking very briefly about um, how you can increase biodiversity in your community. So we obviously know we have these urban species that do very well and they don't really need our help because they're already well adapted to living around people. There's a lot of other things that are suffering. These birds, pollinators, um, small animals, they need help. And the number one way to increase habitat for them is by planting native plants. Um, and the reason is because these plants have evolved for millions of years to support um, our local native wildlife species. This is just one example. And even if you have a very small space, you can convert it into some sort of pollinator meadow or even just if you planted a few things, um, every little bit counts. And this is such an easy way um, to make a really big impact locally. And if you don't know much about plants, you don't know where to start, 
Um, we have tons of resources, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. There's been talks on it that you can watch. Um, there's the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Uh, Jersey Friendly Yards is a great website where you can just type in what you're looking for. If you want something flowering, if you have a spot that's shady, if you want a tree, if you want a flower, you can put in all these filters and it will pop out a list of species that would do well in your yard. Um, National Wildlife Federation, also Audubon, they all have tools that you can use um, to try and figure out what plants would be good for your, your backyard. So that's my little plug for native plants um, in terms of helping other wildlife species that aren't doing so well. And I'll take any more questions. Sure, there's a few we can hit. Um, first of all, for um, we had a couple comments about the poll. Um, if it's not working for you, I apologize. It's working for most people and it's not something we can problem shoot um, in real time here. So I do apologize for that. Um, there was a question, do, gro do groundhogs carry rabies? Groundhogs can carry rabies. Any mammal species can carry it. Um, I believe that the rate of rabies in groundhogs is pretty low. Um, they do carry a form of hepatitis. That's kind of strange. Um, I believe it's very specific to groundhogs, but um, they can carry it. So yeah, in general, like don't ever touch any wildlife. If you have to, for some reason, put on leather gloves, um, put on like, you know, thick gloves that if they do bite you, it's not going to get through. And if you do get bit for some reason, like go get medical attention as soon as possible. Um, there was a comment about, um, well, an anecdote about using an air horn to scare off bears that worked pretty well. Mm, that's a good one. There was also a question about those um, those little those little boxes you can put on the front of your car that make like a high pitched noise that's supposed to scare off deer. Do those work? I've heard about those, and from all the research I've done, because um, we did a whole talk on wildlife vehicle collisions last year, um, those don't work. I don't think there's much data to support that they work at all. Um, it's really just the defensive driving and slowing down and paying attention and, and using your high beams and, and honking. Um, I think those, a lot of those little devices are just, you know, gimmicks or, you know, companies trying to get your money. <laughs> okay. I think, I think those are all the questions we had. Um, well, hang on. Um, there's a few comments that the talk was interesting. They learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, can bucks attack humans during the rut? Very unlikely. Um, I don't think that ever happens, but, you know, it's still a good idea to give them space and, you know, don't try and approach, approach them or get too close because they're just, they're in another world. They're barely even eating this time of year. Their sole purpose for the next five weeks is to just chase the females around. So give them some space, but I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of a single incident that I know of, of, of a deer um, attacking a person. Okay, great. Uh, like well, us on Facebook. I just, I forgot to say that earlier, but we do have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash Rutgers Wildlife. If you like us, we post a bunch of cool stuff about wildlife all the time. And feel free to email me if you have any other questions. Great, thank you, Kathleen. Um, I did want to mention, I think it's our last Earth Day every day for the fall season this year. Oh, wow. Will be next Monday. And that's the impact of road salts. So it's another urban topic, the impact of road salts on streams and rivers. So we hope to see everyone there. Thanks a lot. That was, that was, that was great. Um, yeah, thank you. I'd love, love to learn about the critters and um, I always say, if, um, if you're going to relocate them, don't bring them to my yard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, great job, Kathleen. Thank you. It's, just, it's a great presentation. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Kathleen. OK, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for being here. We appreciate it. I'm going to stop the recording at this point.